Now, we're going to continue today on the, the concept that we started last week about what it means to groan, what, about groaning for the creation and groaning for us and groaning for the Spirit. So if you've got your Bibles, open them please to uh, Romans 8. I have a wonderful, uh, I think it's wonderful anyway, um, slide presentation today, except it's still home on my computer, so we're not going to use that. We're going to wing it. Let's read together. So open your Bibles, if you would, please, and let's read together in um, chapter 8, verse 22 and following. It says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of groaning today. There's a lot of groaning in the world today. You know, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. I thought this a lot about this. You know, there's, a, there's two approaches. There's, there's more than one, but two. But there's two extreme approaches to the whole idea of this pandemic that we have right now. One approach is, one side says, you know, we're way overblowing this thing. This is not really that big of a deal, and, and so let's don't sweat it. The other approach is, I'm not leaving my house because I'm going to get it. You know, that's kind of the two ends of it. And, and the reality is, we need to fall somewhere in the, in the middle there, but we need to have patience and a little bit of kindness for the people who are really struggling with the, 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 the difficulty of this virus. Um, you know, whether you think it is or not, if somebody else thinks it is, it's reality to them. And so that's what we have to deal with. It, we have to deal with their reality. And just so everybody knows, I, went to the, I got up uh, when we were right before collection, went to wash my hands because it had been 10 minutes since I washed. I want to make sure I washed them again. So, uh, no, that was a joke. <laughs> that's not real. You guys aren't much of a mood to joke today, I can tell. All right, listen, what do we got to groan about? What's the creation got to groan about? We talked about it last week at length, and we're not going to talk about it much more today. The creation's groaning because it's been under bad management. And until Jesus, it was under bad management. Now Jesus comes, and there's good management again, and Jesus shows us the way. So, but what do we have to groan about? You know, I thought about this a lot, and there's, there's quite a few things, actually. Obviously, the first thing everybody thinks about right now is coronavirus. Everybody's groaning, oh, you know, a lot of reasons about that. But there's other things. Family problems. Money problems. You know, uh, racism. Politics. Pandemics. Relationships. War. Child abuse. Evil. Those are things to groan about. We groan because those things exist. We groan because it's depressing. This is a depressing world, not like Eden. In Eden, everything was perfect. I love the fact that Mitchell started out and talked to the kids about the, in the beginning. In the beginning, Eden was perfect. There was nothing wrong with it. It was absolutely perfect. It's hard to imagine absolutely perfect because we've never seen absolutely. But, you know, now we know that Eden was that way. So, looking at these scriptures just a little bit closer, there's three things I want us to see about this. And we'll be kind of short today, but three things I want us to see about this. First of all, if you look just at verse 823 alone, that's the one we're going to really focus on. It says, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the spirits, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as to sonship the redemption of our bodies. So why are we groaning today? Well, I think there's three basic reasons I've come up with what causes us to groan today, really. There's a lot of things, but I think they're encompassed in these things. The first thing is, we live in a world where there's sin. That's a, that's a reason to groan for us. It's because it, it's there, it tempts us, it's always available, it's, it's overwhelming almost. Sin's everywhere. I think the second thing, the reason to groan is probably a little more for us personal, 
And that is that if you have family members that are outside of the grace of God, that causes you to groan because that's, that's frightening for us. That scares us. The third reason is, though, I think is that we look at this thing and we compare our misery today and our joy today with what real joy is going to be like in the future. What real joy is going to be like when we're with God. What it's going to be like to have that kind of joy. And thinking about how bad it is now sometimes makes us groan, also makes us impatient. You know, and we'll talk about impatience in just a second. The next thing it says, though, as I want you to see, it says that we have the first fruits. I thought about first fruits. What does that mean? Yeah, I, I know Jerry, he grows tomatoes, and I grow tomatoes and apples, and we grow other things. And so you all grow something. If you grow tomatoes, there's nothing like that first tomato you pick. You pick that first tomato. Why is that so important? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One is it's a sign of the times, right? you got tomatoes. But the biggest reason is it's a sign of what's to come. It's a sign of what, because you know where you got that one tomato? More's coming. There's going to be a lot more coming. And so that's exciting. So you get excited because there's more coming. This first fruit that we have is kind of like that. This is the first fruit that is our, our, our this is our first taste of things. Our first, our first tomato we get is the spirit that fills us. It's inside us and fills us. It's, it's, our, it's our guarantee. It's out there knowing that there's more to come that we're not going to be left alone. There's more to come. And it's exciting when we think about that. That, oh man, this is just a touch. This is just a taste. I love the song service this morning, Ron. It was great. You know, I thought I, I, it was very, to me, it was, it was a, it's, a, it's a morning that we can, we can really see that things are pretty uns, unstable in this world. But we have a redemptive guarantee. If you're in Christ today, and I'm only talking to you if you're in Christ today, you have nothing to worry about. Your worries are over. And that's exciting. There's other things that are happening, obviously, around us. The first fruits are something that we, we just, it's just a big deal. It's part of us. <clears throat> you know, have you, ever, have you ever been on a, I'm sure you have, a big vacation that's, that's like the, something you've never done before. About a year and a half ago, Diane and I decided to go on a cruise. And I tell you, it took me about five years to decide if I wanted to because somehow I didn't think I wanted to. It just didn't sound like a very good, not like much fun, you know, to go on a cruise. But we decided to go to Alaska. And so we started prepping. You know, we have to do all these things way ahead of time. So we started prepping way early, months early. You know, we got tickets. We did all that kind of stuff, got the airline tickets. And then we, we got on YouTube and, and found video of the, of the ship we were going to be on so we could see what it looked like and get it prepared for it. And then we would listen to people on YouTube and see, what do you expect? What should you take with you? What should you not take with you? What, what do you do? You know, and, and so all this anticipation, and I'm telling you, our trip started when we started anticipating it. When we started getting ready for it, it started. And it was exciting. And then, you know what? We got on the boat. We had a great time, and you don't have to convince me to go again. I'm, I'm ready to go any time. So if you've got a spare ticket, let me know. You know, so anyway, but we always anticipate these things. But, you know, sometimes we can be impatient. Have you ever traveled with kids? You go on somewhere with kids. What do they, what's the first thing that they do when they sit down in the back seat after you drove out of the driveway? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? After about the 10th time, you think, you know, it's only been 10 minutes. We're not there yet. You know, we were not there yet. But they're impatient. They're impatient. And sometimes we're impatient. You know, we're, we're impatient because we know there's something coming. Now, we have a little different situation, however. What's coming is the unknown. You can't get on YouTube and find out what heaven looks like. You can't get on YouTube and find out what it's going to be like to pass through. And so it's an unknown to us. And so we keep worrying about that. And it's and something that, to think about, you know, that we're anticipating this thing, but it, we're not sure about it. But then it says that we uh, will be uh, waiting for our adoption as sons. 
That was an interesting phrase. You know, I, I don't know if your family's involved in adoption, but our family has been involved in adoption in a lot of different ways. Diane's adopted. I don't know if you knew that or not, but she's adopted. And, you know, I, I was thinking about that, and then Heather was adopted. And, and I, I remember going to the court when the day that Heather was adopted, her, uh, final, you know, when it was made final. And what was exciting about that is she'd already been part of our family for a long time. I mean, we never thought about it. We considered her our granddaughter for a long time. But then that day came when they stamped that approved sign on it. All of a sudden, it was reality. The name changed. It was different. Wow. That's kind of where we are. We're adopted children already. But we're going to get the stamp on it pretty soon. But that stamp is interesting. Now, here's, what it really, here's where I really want to talk about this today. Because this has been a, a really a, a revelation to me to really think through this and, and see these scriptures like this. It says, um, in verse uh, 23, it says, toward the end of verse 23, it says, we groan inwardly as we wait for our adoptions as sons. Now, that's the official adoption we're talking about, okay? But here's where it really gets interesting, the redemption of our bodies. My theology has always been, I've understood that we are going to be, you know, our spirits are going to be redeemed, we're going to, our souls are going to be with God, we're going to have these things. But all of a sudden, he's saying, no, your bodies are going to be redeemed. We're going to be physical. We're going to be like Jesus. Now, how was Jesus? Was he physical? Was Jesus physical? Yeah, he ate. Lots of times. He, they let people touch him. Lots of times. But he was different. He wasn't the same physical. He was different. Yeah, I mean, he could just appear. And he could disappear. He was physical, but he was different. I think that's what we're going to be like. Uh, I could be wrong, and that's okay if I am. It's going to be good no matter what. But I think it's going to be like that. I think we're going to be physical. I think I'm going to be able to look and say, hey, there's Candy. I know her. I remember her. She's a lot younger than she used to be, though. You know? <laughs> and that's how it's going to be. We're going to look at, you know, I have all kinds of questions about that. What age are we going to be? You know, or what, what point in our life are we going to be? You know, are we going to be, are we all going to be 25 in appearance? I don't know. Or is it going to matter? We probably won't care. But I think we're going to know each other. I think we're going to understand things. We're going to see things. We're going to have, we're going to be in Eden. We're going to live in Eden. We're going to walk and talk with God every day. We're going to be in Eden. What do you got to worry about? You know, when you look at this hope, this hope that what we had to look forward to makes you wonder, why do we hang on to this so tightly? And we hang on to it because it's still an unknown. We still don't know in our own heart. We haven't experienced it yet. So we don't really know. But we can trust God that it's good. No matter whether my interpretation of this is right or not, it doesn't really make any difference. What matters is that we can trust God. We can trust him with our future. We can trust him with our eternity. We can trust him with our present. We have a pandemic. Is it possible that some of us in this congregation will get it? Yeah. Is it possible some of us will get really sick? Yeah. We're pretty old, some of us. Fact is, if you were born in the 1940s, here's a shocker for you. Are you ready for this? Steve, are you ready for this? 1940s? You are now in your ninth decade. Ninth decade. Figured out. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Figured out. Ninth decade. I'm in my ninth decade, too. Man, that made me feel really old when I counted that on my fingers and found out. But, so if you're born in the 50s, like Ron over here, you're only in your eighth decade. You've got lots of time left. Yeah. So, 60s? Oh, seventh decade. Good grief. Children. Ch children. Just children. Everywhere. We have a hope for the future that cannot be shaken. I don't know what the next... Weeks are going to happen. Months are going to happen. I hope we can always continue to meet together. I think we can. 
I would say, though, if you're feeling ill or if you're, or if you are concerned, if you have any kind of problems, respiratory problems and stuff, don't come. Don't come. We put everything on tape. You can listen to it maybe a few days later that you can listen to it. But know that if you want to be here and you can be here, we're going to try to be here. Because together, we're going to be together a long, long time. And that's pretty exciting. Now, this hope is only for you if you're in Christ. If you're sitting there and you don't have that relationship secure with Jesus, your hope is a little shaky. Your, your whole future is a little shaky. It's a little bit difficult to think about life without hope. I can't even imagine in my life at this point in time how I would have got through my life without hope, without the relationship with Jesus. Because our hope is not some pie-in-the-sky hope. It's something God has developed in his creation, from the creation on. It's a development that he's always had in mind. His goal is for us to be together with him. His desire is for us to be together with him. He says, and Peter says that, you know, it's, it's his desire to have none fall short of the glory of God, but all be saved. But you know what? I want you all to be saved. But I'm really concerned about me. And so are you. But if you're not in Christ, it's a scary thought. And you know what? I wouldn't face these days without being faithful to Jesus. It's the most important thing you can be right now. We face difficult times, interesting times. Who knows what's going to happen? A lot of time we spend together. Get good at board games. Lots of things going on. But I want you to know that Jesus is there and he loves us. And we can be secure in him. We can be totally confident of our future because of him. If you need prayers, let's pray. If you need to find Jesus right now, let's study. Let's get together. But whatever you need, know that this body of people are here and we're going to help each other get to heaven the best we can. If you need anything, won't you come as we stand and sing together?